Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon. What happens here? One of my writers, in this case, Katie, thank you, Katie, has written a script for me, Flight 980, The Missing Black Box. I... Why is it that is so fascinating about planes that disappear? I recently made a video about the Bermuda Triangle. Not sure if you guys have seen it yet. Maybe it's gone out, maybe it hasn't. They don't always go out in the order I record them, these episodes, that is. Uh, it's just something fascinating about it, isn't it? It's kind of uh, I, definitely a morbid fascination. It's like, what happened to that plane? 300 people or whatever on it just disappeared. The Malaysian Airlines one, famously. Um, there was the, the one of the big, like most memorable Twitter posts that I remember and it like sticks with me as being so dark was after that Malaysian Airlines flight disappeared there was another one that was shot down over Russia or Chechnya or something where was it? I don't remember but it was shot down like six months later and everyone on board died and there was a Twitter picture or an Instagram photo from a guy just a guy travelling on the plane at the airport and he's like doing a selfie with the plane in the background being like there it is that's what to look for in case it disappears and then that plane was shot down and it's like oh my god this is just one of those super morbid things. It was just a young dude, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> Fucking horrible situation. Anyway, uh, that's a brilliant start to the episode. How cheery. Uh, let's just get into it, shall we? It's a beautiful story. <laughs> Did I mention that I've never read this before? That's what we do here on this show. We explore this together. We decode the unknown, if you will. Ah, clever, right? <laughs> This one's a pretty good mystery, as there are a few different things going on that all ends up leading to big fat question marks. It also feels like one of those things that can actually be solved, although there is, of course, the shadow of a conspiracy theory, which would mean never finding out what really happens. I wouldn't be a good decoding the unknown episode if there wasn't a conspiracy theory or aliens thrown in with the, was the uh, blah, 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 blah. Excuse me, it's Monday morning. This is the first thing I'm recording all week. My mouth is still warming up. I never quite know how much to give away in these introductions, but this story involves a plane crash where the crash itself is a mystery, suspiciously stymied recovery operations, no bodies, and a missing black box that could answer the questions about the entire event. In fact, pretty much the only things definitively recovered from the crash site are a load of smuggled caiman skins. Wait, isn't that that little lizard thing? <laughs> Okay. Yes, the small alligator-related thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. If you're thinking, didn't Simon do this one already? No, that would be what happened to Flight 739, which was an excellent episode if I do say so myself. All right, Katie. And did reference a piano playing dark and a killer whale, but no caiman skins. All right. Now, is it terrible that I have no memory of that episode? <laughs> I think I have that disease, the brain, that brain disease where you forget stuff. Yeah. You have Alzheimer's or something? Either that or I just make a lot of videos. Okay, now we got that straight. Let's explore all the unknowns surrounding Eastern Airlines Flight 980. And boy, are there some unknowns going on here. The crash. On New Year's Day 1985, Eastern Airlines Flight 980 was coming in for a landing at El Alto International Airport in La Paz, Bolivia. El Alto is one of the highest airports in the world, so it's got an extra long runway to account for the extra speed that a plane has to carry to successfully land at higher altitude than normal. Um, I am going to guess that's because air is thinner at a higher altitude and so it has less resistance. Maybe? The pilot for Flight 980 was Larry Campbell, but he was an experience with landing at altitude, this only being his second time flying into El Alto. Wait, that's the captain? Surely he should be co-pilot, flying into that airport a few times <laughs> before he's doing it, like, as the actual captain, no? Eh? Are you sure about this? With about 10 minutes until the anticipated landing, the pilot was cleared to descend to 18,000 feet. What happened next has never been fully explained, but the result was the Boeing 727 flew straight into the backside of Mount Ilmani, shattering the plane and killing everyone on board. While the plane could hold only 100 passengers when full, there were only 19 passengers and 10 crew on Flight 980's last journey. It is weird when you're on an empty... I was once on a plane, it was a giant A380 out of somewhere, which is that giant double-decker passenger plane. And I swear to God, there were like five other people in economy. I was just like walking around the plane. It's like, there's no one here. It was bizarre. It was like a six hour flight on a giant plane and it was empty. 
While survivors were never really anticipated, the search and recovery missions carried out in the wake of the crash ranged from slightly suspicious to almost farcical. The Bolivian Air Force managed to find the main crash site from the air the following day, but the incident team couldn't make it up the mountain due to bad weather and avalanches, which, yes, does seem like a valid reason to wait a while. As it was a U.S. plane that went down, the National Transportation Safety Board NTSB, assembled a team to investigate the accident and to track down the infamous black boxes. These are the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder, both of which are extremely useful, if not essential, in working out why and how the plane managed to crash into the mountain. This is so uh, when a domestic plane or a plane from a certain country crashes in another country, surely it's down to the local authorities to do the investigation rather than the home country, because that's who has authority over that territory. Like if an American plane crashes in an enemy country or whatever, or a country they don't have diplomatic relations. Well, in that case, I guess it's got to be done by just diplomacy. It'd be like, yeah, we'll let the NTSB in, Bolivia says, rather than like some other country. We'd be like, no chance. No, we investigated ourselves and we found out we absolutely did not shoot down that plane. It was a fuel explosion. The videos on social media of that missile headed towards it wasn't a missile. Unfortunately, none of the climbers or investigators rapidly assembled by the NTSB managed to get acclimated to the high altitude in Bolivia and were all too ill to make the climb. ALPA, or the Airline Pilots Association, also tried to send a team up the mountain but were unable to for the same reason, altitude sickness and just a general lack of preparedness. The US then asked neighboring Peru if they could borrow a high altitude helicopter to fly up Mount Alamali, but because of pettiness and trying to avoid looking inadequate, Bolivia got the hump and wouldn't allow the helicopter in. Eventually, though, it got over itself and permission for the helicopter to fly up to the crash site was granted. In a scheme that seems like something Pierce Brosnan's James Bond would do, as we all know, the best James Bond, ARPA chairman Bud Leopard decided that he'd jump out of the helicopter at 21,000 feet and then ski back down the mountain. Absolute legend. He's the chairman of this organization? How old is he? <laughs> Also, I, I feel like I, me saying that Piers Brosnan is the best James Bond just entirely dates me. Like I feel like anytime someone says that's my Bond, he's my favorite Bond, uh, it just like says how you know what James Bond you grew up with. Because I think generally everyone prefers Daniel Craig, right? That's the general consensus among critics and, and whatnot. But I grew up with Piers Brosnan, and in my mind, he's what James Bond looks like. <laughs> I mean, I didn't literally grow up with him. That'd be weird. Like, I grew up with him playing James Bond. That, just in case that wasn't clear. What are you? My father? Yeah, I'm your father. Piers Brosnan's not my dad. <laughs> I don't really know what he hoped to achieve by this. Maybe the altitude sickness was affecting his critical thinking. Number one, the helicopter can't get too near the mountain or it'd crash, so he's got a high possibility of injuring himself when jumping out. Number two, if he managed to find the recorders, how is he proposing on getting them down the mountain? They weigh about 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms today, so presumably they'd have been a bit bulkier in the mid-1980s. He might have needed tools to retrieve them and secure them to himself, and at altitude, that's a lot of work. And number three, the skiing down idea was stupid as the terrain was rocky, the weather had been bad, and avalanches had stopped the Bolivians sending anyone up earlier. Maybe a midlife crisis was the real inspiration here. Luckily, Leopard's foolhardy stump was put to bed when he discovered that the high-altitude helicopter wasn't high-altitude enough, and it wouldn't be able to hover in the thin air at 21,000 feet. <laughs> You're the head of the Pilots Association. How do you not know this, or just at least look into it a little? Or ask someone who's got a helicopter like to be like, can it happen? And be like, no. <laughs> what are you doing? Do you even know how to ski, Bob? What was his name? It wasn't Bob, was it? I don't think we learned his name. Good news, we don't care. Another helicopter was requested for the mission from US-based Sikorsky aircraft, which is now part of Lockheed Martin. This experimental high-altitude helicopter was sent to Bolivia in pieces to be assembled there, but you guessed it, the engineers sent to put it together were too altitude sick to do anything for several days. Of course, I know that altitude sickness is a real thing and it affects everyone differently, but man, these Americans are really taking this lack of oxygen hard. Yeah. <laughs> But it does affect different people differently. Like, I remember, um, have I told this story before? I've definitely told it on one of my other podcasts. But my school, I didn't go on this trip, but there was like a, a, a summer trip to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And a couple of mates of mine went. And one of them, he was like training so hard. He was like in the gym, on the running machine, doing like these weird climbing exercises and stuff, getting trained up to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And another friend of mine was just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do for prepar preparation is just have a bit of a smoke. 
just smoke some cigarettes. And actually, in retrospect, now that I actually think about it, maybe smoking does help because you get used to having less, o- less oxygen in your blood, but that, I mean, surely not right. Anyway, these two guys go off with some other guys from school and they go to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And my friend, the guy who's been training in the gym and stuff, he gets altitude sickness and he can't make it to the top. And the smoker, he did absolutely no trainings, just like, did it, mate, didn't I? No worries. And then like a few years later, maybe a couple of years later, same school, we used to have these like motivational talks or whatever on a Friday. And this this guy came in and he's got no arms and he's got no legs and he's talking about all the stuff that he's done in his life. And uh, he's just like, yeah, so we climbed up Mount Kilimanjaro and we didn't take the tourist route that's easy for people to climb. We took the difficult route around the back of the mountain. <laughs> My mate's just like, oh, for f- sake. The guy with no arms and legs went up the hard way. <laughs> ah. Yeah, it was motivational, but boy, did we take the piss out of my mate constantly. <laughs> Next time I see him, I'm going to remind him of that. <laughs> God, I'm such a dick. Let's carry on. Anyway, helicopters are finally working. They did manage to fly us up Mount Ilamani, but they missed their window and the weather was now too bad to let anyone out. So <laughs> This is a bit of a joke, isn't it? The helicopter was only on loan for about a week. So that was the end of that attempt. You're the US government. Just borrow it for another week. You've got basically unlimited money. By this point, you might be thinking, what the heck? Just get some Bolivian climbers up there again. They've already acclimated and they're ready to go. When in actual fact, during all of these false starts, someone had quietly made it to the crash site. A mere two days after Flight 980 had crashed, Bonanzo Garachi, who was, yes, a Bolivian climber, made it up to the wreck site. If I was a Bolivian climber and they're like, do you want to go up and see that uh, plane crash? And I'll, uh, first question I ask, is anyone alive? And they'd be like, the chances are basically zero. And I'd be like, then no. <laughs> That is not my job. I have no desire to go up there and see all those mangled bodies and bits of clothing flying around the place because that is... Honestly, I don't know. I didn't sign up for that, did I? I know someone's got to do it. I know it's not nice, but it's not me. It was unclear at this time on whose behalf he made the hike, lending more credence to the increased cries of a cover-up. His report of what he discovered was also hushed up. He later stated that officials had threatened him, and he wasn't mentioned in Bolivia's official report of the accident. There are no pictures of the site from his track, although I think that's because he didn't take any camera equipment, as opposed to them being suppressed. Peter Frick Wright, in a piece for OutsideOnline.com, managed to catch up with Garachi around 2006 and got more of a fuller picture from him. Frick Wright also has a more immediate connection with the story, which we'll come to a bit later on. Oh no, did someone who knows die? Because this is like, a, this is a deep pull. Like, I've never heard of OutsideOnline.com. And before uh, Katie mentioned that there was an interview with the guy, being like, oh, no, it's some conspiracy theory site, isn't it? But I'm guessing that this dude maybe had someone on the plane, knew someone on the plane or something like that, and he's interviewing him for a website. That's going to be intense. Or maybe he was the owner of those Cayman skins. What Karachi did find in 1985 was plane debris, open suitcases, lots of Cayman skins. Well, at least he found those, but no human bodies and no flight recorders. Garachi and the other two climbers with him couldn't stay at the site for too long as they had no supplies and there was no way to drop any more, seeing as how Bud Leopard was prevented from his Bond star shenanigans. Prevented from his Bond star shenanigans by them being just logistically impossible in every way. So they had to come down the next day. This is where the military picked them up, interrogated and threatened them, and made an official report stating that no bodies or blood had been found at the scene. Garachi told Frick Wright that he had seen blood at the Side, he was just too afraid of the interrogators to disagree with their narrative. So, while this was a successful expedition in some respects, we still didn't learn much from it as no flight recorders were found. A few subsequent tracks have been made to the site, one which included the widow of William Kelly who had died on the flight. Judith Kelly did things the right way, taking her time to acclimate to the higher altitude before beginning her climb in July 1985. She took letters that she had written for her husband, as well as letters from other family members of the victims, and buried them at the site. By now, the remains of the plane had started descending the mountain on their own accord. Flight 980 hit at the top of the mountain, and since then, pieces have been sliding down in snow and ice falls. So it stood until 2016. Whoa, we're jumping ahead a few decades. We were still none the wiser as the circumstances surrounding the plane crash. The official report from the US side of things gave their verdict as controlled flight into terrain, which tells us what happened. The plane flew into a mountain, but not why or how. And what happens in 2016 then? Well, adventurous ex-soldier Dan Petrell found out about Flight 980 and its missing black box and decided to find it for himself, <laughs> along with his roommate Isaac Stoner. <laughs> Great name. The <laughs> Isaac Stoner. <laughs> 
Oh, man. The pair started training for the challenge by sleeping in special altitude tents and running up and down a lot of stairs. Maybe that's what my mate should have done. He should have got a special tent. Shortly before their expedition, word got out to Peter Prick Rye, who I mentioned before, and he joined the party. Even with their hypoxic tent training, the climb was still arduous and hard, but with a lucky break in the weather, the team made it to the crash site, which was more exposed than it had ever been. Well, it wasn't really the original crash site anymore, as everything had been falling down the mountain for 30 years, but they had reached the debris field a Flight 980. Thanks to a steep drop in the mountain, a lot of the plane debris is now almost 3,000 feet lower than a smaller field higher up. Almost immediately, they found a human femur, which totally undermined the no-bodies aspect of the story. Over the course of their first search, they found another part of a leg bone and a piece of spine. Oh my god. Dudes. In total, there were six instances of human remains, according to Dan Futrell's blog about their trip. While that is proof that people died, it's still not enough to account for 29 people. Futrell says that the area they searched was about 1 mile by 0.75 miles or 1.6 by 1.2 kilometers. They found many plane parts, shoes, clothes, and lots of caiman skins. <laughs> what is going on with these caiman skins? <laughs> But not the black boxes they were after. These caiman skins are going to confuse the shit out of future archaeologists. They'll be like, how did these caimans get to the top of a mountain? <laughs> and where are their, where's their bones? Where's their flesh? Why is it just the skin? Even though they're called black boxes, the flight recorders are usually housed in a bright orange case to make it easy to find them in situations such as this. Vitrell and his team did find scraps of orange metal, which they thought might be parts of the casing, but these boxes are supposed to be almost indestructible, so finding scraps and twisted bits of orange metal didn't bode that well for finding anything usefully salvageable. On the final day of their search, Isaac Stoner found some metal with wiring that had an abbreviation for cockpit voice recorder on it. Finally. But that was it. There wasn't anything else attached to it. Nearby, however, was some tape that they fervently hoped was part of the recording device. Once they got home, they tried to send the samples of orange metal and the tape to the NTSB for analysis, but as Peter Frick Wright's article said, they had inadvertently violated Annex 13 of the Convention on International Civil Aviation. <laughs> the evidence should have remained in Bolivia, as that's where the crash happened. After months of trying to contact anyone in Bolivia about this, Fatrell finally got permission from Bolivian officials that the NTSB could investigate the pieces. Well, that kind of points away from a cover-up, unless they're all in Bolivia absolutely certain they got everything and this is just some, you know, musical tape that was in the someone's luggage. And what were the results? Well, as the title of this episode may suggest, they were not what anyone was hoping for. In February 2017, the NTSB released the findings of the fragments taken from the crash site, and here's part of their report. The materials provided to the NTSB consist of several metal fragments, one damaged spool of magnetic tape, and two additional off-spool sections of magnetic tape. Examination of the materials revealed no identifiable specific serial numbers. One metal piece was identified as a cockpit voice recorder rack. Other metal pieces were consistent with parts related to the flight data recorder pressurized container assembly all right so we finally have proof of part of a recorder so what was on the tape well here's what the ndsb found the magnetic tape on the spool was 13 and a quarter inch u-matic videotape and when reviewed it was found to contain an 18 minute recording of the trial by treehouse episode of the television series i spy dubbed into spanish so either this definitely either is a hell of a coincidence, like some device just happens to use the same stuff as a flight data recorder, or that was somewhere else in the flight and it got close to the data recorder and so they put them together as being this must be from this, that's definitely more plausible. Um, or someone from Bolivia grabbed some tape, went up there, got the real recording, grabs that, put the fake tape at the site, thought it was damaged enough, but all future restoration techniques managed to fix it and were done with it. I have to say, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, but this is seeming pretty goddamn suspicious, isn't it, Bolivia? Isn't it? I'm gonna get interrogated and killed. While that's disappointing, the episode does have an 8.2 rating on IMDb, though, so at least it was a decent one. Presumably this was part of the in-flight entertainment, and while he was obviously pretty gutted about it, Futrell seems optimistic on his blog that all the correct tapes are still out there, probably close to where they were looking, just waiting to be found. Is it so obvious that that's just part of the in-flight entertainment, or is it... I don't know, it does seem pretty suspicious that they were right next to each other. Were they right next to each other? What were we looking at? Some metal wiring abbreviation. Um, nearby, they found some tape. Oh, okay, so it was just nearby. And I mean... 
I guess they could be close to each other on the plane. I, I, okay, 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 Katie. I'm kind of coming around to you, this not being a conspiracy theory, which is weird for me because usually it's the other way around. I don't know. What do you think, listener? Am I crazy? <laughs> it's suspicious, right? Are you going crazy? And now we're a few further years on with not much more information than we had at the start. So let's get to the questions and theories. There are lots of them. Why did the plane crash? This is the biggie. How could a passenger plane that was supposedly on course for El Alto Airport end up crashing into a mountain? There are a few factors that play into this, but without the flight data recorders, we can't know 100% what really happened. We already know, thanks to me mentioning altitude sickness about 100 times, that the airport was way higher up than most other airports anywhere in the world. Pilots are supposed to wear oxygen masks on approach and all the way to the gate, so they're not affected by the change in altitude. Um... Oh, and all the way to the gate. Oxygen mask on approach and all the way to the gate. That doesn't... Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. When a plane's in the air, it's a pressurized cabin. So you're obviously the pilots are not affected by the lack of altitude. So I guess it's just out of an abundance of caution in case there is a depressurization just as the plane is coming in. So they wear the oxygen masks just in case that happens, which seems, I mean extra super safe. So I guess this is going to push us into the theory that they didn't bother because they were like, oh, this is ridiculous. It's a pressurized cabin. If something happens, we'll put the masks on. And then the cabin did repressurize. They lost consciousness or the ability to operate the aircraft properly, which happens incredibly quickly. Um, and they didn't, they didn't put their oxygen masks on and they crashed the plane. Possible. The pilot on Flight 980 was only making his second landing at El Alto, so did something go wrong with him? Well, even if he became ill or something, there was another pilot right next to him, and there was also a flight engineer hanging out in first class. If there had been any sign of an issue, he'd be the first one trying to help out, although interestingly the Boeing 727 had a three-person cockpit, meaning that the engineer really should have been with the pilots during the flight. <laughs> He's like, guys, you're alright, right? Do I need to engineer anything right now? He's like, no, because there's a, there's a life lap bed waiting for me in first class and a glass of champagne. Campaign, so I'll be back there. You guys have a good time. He probably wouldn't be drinking. At 8.30, he definitely wouldn't be drinking. <laughs> at 8.38 p.m. Eastern Time, the plane was in touch with ground control in La Paz and seemed on track, flying at 20,000 feet. They had been given the all clear to descend to 18,000 feet, but shortly after that, the plane hit the mountain and communications went dead. It should be noted that there was no radar at El Alto Airport, and ground control couldn't really help pilots all that much, as the equipment they did have wasn't the best. Instead, the cockpit crew of the planes had to work out the navigation more or less for themselves. The weather was bad, which hardly helped matters, so are all these factors adding up to pilot error and a very unfortunate accident. Probably. The Bureau of Aircraft Accidents Archive states, The crew deviated from the prescribed route apparently to avoid bad weather, when at an altitude of 19,600 feet, the aircraft struck the slope of Mount Nevado Ilamani, 6,400 meters, located 43 kilometers southwest of runway 28. The aircraft disintegrated on impact, and all 29 occupants were killed. The probable cause was given as controlled flight into terrain after the crew failed to realize his altitude path were incorrect while cruising in limited visibility due to the night and clouds up above up to 9,000 meters. There might have been technical problems going on inside the plane, which added to their woes, but again, without the data recorders, we can't know for sure. There are other theories, though. This is decoding the unknown, after all, and it would be boring if it was just an open and shut case. Well, it's definitely not an open and shut case, because it's like, where did those flight recorders go? Why was everyone not cooperating? It's it's definitely weird. There's definitely something going on. It's like one of those things where it's like, I don't know what the conspiracy theory is, but it's like something's not right. Because there's plenty of other plane crashes where it's just like everything's recovered and it's like open and shut. Easy. I feel like that's the vast majority. So what's going on here is suspicious. Was it a bomb? A mid-air explosion which then launched the plane into the mountain might explain a few of the details of the case. In 2014, a former Eastern Airline pilot, George Jen, published a book called Final Destination Disaster. Personally, I think you could have workshopped the title a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, Jen creates the case for a bomb having been on board, pointing to how this would have depressurized the plane, either blowing apart the people inside or sucking their bodies out to land all over the place and quite a distance from where the plane eventually hit. If you follow this train of thought, it covers another point as well. Depending on where the bomb was, it might also have blown apart the casings for the flight recorders, which in the 1980s may not have been as robust as they are these days. Yo. If it's gonna... 
I know bombs are powerful and all that, but a plane flying into a mountain? A bomb is going to destroy it, but a plane, a Boeing 727 flying into a mountain is not going to destroy it? Come on. That seems a bit much, doesn't it? Although I guess bombs are quite powerful. I don't know enough about ballistics to know this, but it seems like a plane crash is going to be fairly intense. But why would anyone want to blow up a plane with only a few people on it? There are actually a few reasons for thinking that the plane was taken out on purpose. Who was on board? I've mentioned there were 19 passengers and 10 crew on the plane, but it might be helpful to go into a bit more detail as to who these people were. Of the 29 on board, there were 9 Koreans, 8 Americans, 7 Paraguayans, and 5 Chileans. Five of the Paraguayan passengers were from the Matalon family, who had a very well-known and successful business in home appliances. One of the Americans was the aforementioned William Kelly, whose widow hiked up to the crash site to pay her respects. He was the director of the United States Peace Corps delegation to Paraguay at the time of the crash. Another American who died was Marion Davis, notably the wife of the U.S. ambassador to Paraguay. The ambassador himself was supposed to be on Flight 980, but had a life-saving last-minute change of plans. So yeah, there were people on the flight, or who were supposed to be on the flight, that could have been targets for assassination. Yeah, but if you look at any flight, there's going to be someone on there, someone's going to be like, yeah, someone could want to assassinate this guy. It's kind of weird though, but you know when the, you like you see like a plane crash and you look up on Wikipedia and it's like notable, you know, victims or whatever. It's like the number of times there's like notable people there, you're like, "Whoa. There's a lot of notable people." Let's yonk another thread here and delve a bit deeper into Eastern Airlines itself. If you're not familiar with the name, it's because it dissolved in 1991. The name has apparently been brought back and relaunched in recent years, but the iteration we're talking about ceased operation 20 years ago. Yeah, I feel like I've been on Eastern Airlines, and I have, it definitely wasn't in 1991. Does it operate out of China or something? I feel like I know this airline. It was a large and successful airline in its day, but it seems that its success might have also come from other, more shady dealings. Perhaps in Cayman skins. <laughs> in 1985, the same year as the Flight 980 incident, US Customs busted Eastern Airlines after lots and lots of cocaine was found stuffed in suitcases flown from Colombia to Miami. They were fined $1.3 million, which is over $3 million today. Whoa, that seems very mild for cocaine smuggling. <laughs> like, you fly that into Singapore? And it's like, they hang everyone on the board. <laughs> According to the New York Times, in an article from September 27, 1986, another federal official estimated as much as 300 pounds of cocaine a week was brought into Miami in this manner over the three-year period, and that airport crews were paid as much as $250,000 to clear each shipment. Uh, so those airport crews, they're getting paid, that's insane. But... How does this work when you're like a baggage unloader and let's say you're getting 10% of that like every week? That's like a million dollars a year. How are you going to like, it's like, what, why do you have a Ferrari? And it's like, um, d d airport baggage handling pays great. Surely that is, looks mad suspicious. The year following the crash, 22 Eastern Airline workers were indicted on drug smuggling charges. This didn't help Eastern's business model, which was already starting to flounder against new, lower-cost airlines. Add in that a whopping fine of $9.5 million in safety violations in 1987, which is over $23 million today. Katie, I feel like your idea of whopping, like, obviously $9.5 million is a lot of money. But to a large corporation, $9.5 million is a slap on the wrist. Didn't Elon Musk get fined like $25 million for a tweet where he said he was thinking about taking Tesla private? And then he got, and that was on top of another $25 million fine for Tesla or something like that. I don't remember the exact details, but it was like $50 million in fines for a tweet. $9.5 million or $23 million today for safety violations on an airliner? Big deal is not a big fine. And financially ruinous strikes in 1989, you can see why the airline bit the dust. If an airline is going bust because of a $9.5 million fine, that airline needs to, you know, do better at business. All right, so let's get to the drugs angle. George Jen's book posits that Eastern Airlines was actually in cahoots with then US President Ronald Reagan and secretly running drugs to finance the Iran Contra affair. First half of that sentence, I was like, that's insane. That's an insane thing to say. What are you talking about? Why does anyone think that? And then the second half of that sentence reminded me that Iran Contra was a thing. 
and you're like, oh my god. Yeah, sometimes the conspiracy theory is real. We're not going to get into this, but this was a political scandal in the mid to late 1980s involving the US and supposed illegal weapons trades with Iran in order to finance the rebel Contra group in Nicaragua. Wait, is this, a, is this alleged or did this happen? I guess it's allegedly still. Political scandal involving supposed illegal weapons trades. Wait, I thought Iran Contra actually happened, and that was a confirmed thing, but I don't know, allegedly. Okay, okay, anyway, carrying on. Yes, it's complicated, but Jen's basically saying that the US deliberately fudged the investigation into Flight 980 to hide evidence of the ties uh, to Reagan and the Iran-Contra mess. According to Jen, this then led to Easton's ultimate demise. Uh, is this a totally unsubstantiated conspiracy theory? Yes, of course it is, but it's fun to speculate too. Let's carry on with the drug smuggling. Okay, if we're still on this deliberately destroyed tack, let's go back over what we do know. There were high-ranking people on board this plane, some of whom would have targets on their back for political or financial reasons. I mean, out of 19 passengers, five were part of a rich and powerful family business empire, one was the director of the Peace Corps in Paraguay, and the US ambassador to Paraguay was supposed to be on there. I couldn't find out anything about the Korean passengers, who made up the majority of the list, but without even taking them into account, there are a few high-profile passengers on the list. There was another incident of a bomb taking out a passenger plane in order to assassinate a Colombian presidential candidate that happened just a few years later in 1989. That's Pablo Escobar's plane bombing, right? And do you remember who was behind that? Yeah, I do! The king of cocaine himself, Pablo Flippin' Escobar! Unfortunately for es Escobar and everyone else on Avianca Flight 203, his intended target, Cesar Gavria, wasn't even on the plane. I remember this from… from Narcos. And also a biographics video I made about Escobar, but mostly from mostly from narcos. Is this a weird but noteworthy connection to Flight 980? I don't think Escobar had any links with Paraguay, so this is probably just stretching a tenuous coincidence. Also, no cocaine was found, or at least reported in the wreckage of Flight 980, although if it had burst open in the snow, I guess you'd never know it was there. Yeah, it blows away in the wind of a fiery explosion. Fly 980 wasn't flying from Colombia either, so we can probably discount involvement from Escobar or any other rival cartels. They just thought it was kind of fun to add in, being that we were talking about drug smuggling and stuff. There is one smuggling element I know you're waiting for, though. What's with all the Cayman skins? How many Cayman skins were possibly on this plane? So yes, we finally get to the crux of the story. <laughs> okay, The reptile skins strewn all over Mount Ilimani. This was the 1980s, where it was cool to wear crocodile skin clothes or whatever, so trade in this thing meant killing the ass of animals on a massive scale. Unsurprisingly, this meant that trade was eventually restricted on reptile skins and that having a huge amount of caiman hides in the hold of Flight 980 was definitely illegal. According to a blog post by Isaac Stoner, another member of the 2016 expedition to the crash site, pieces of this skin were literally everywhere. Before identifying the animal as probably a caiman, he wrote, Pieces of snake slash alligator slash crocodile skins are scattered all over the mountain. In picking up a plane part for a closer look, often there would be a crocodile hide on or near the part. This is so bizarre. <laughs> they are in such abundance that we actually became quite sick of them as we combed the field for the black box. <laughs> He's like, these crocodile skins everywhere are weird. What's this, piece of spine? Totally normal. Stoner also theorized that the huge haul of contraband might have been a factor in why the investigation into the crash ended up being less than rigorous. He wrote, These illegal animal skins are part of a larger pattern of smuggling illegal goods on Eastern Airlines commercial flights. Someone in the organization was making money on these sketchy practices. If some of this money found its way into the right pockets, it would be easy to delay the appropriate investigational response until many feet of snow slash ice covered the crash site. Even more food for thought. As Isaac mentioned, looking for the black box a minute ago, uh, let's get back on track and try to work out what the heck happened to it. What the heck happened to the black box? Shall we make our way back to the point of this story? Wait a minute, Katie. I thought the point of the story was about the Cayman skins. <laughs> so bizarre. To fully understand what happened in aircraft incidents, it's important to get a hold of what's known as that black box. This, as we mentioned, is the flight data recorder that records everything going on on the plane system. Since 1997, in the US at least, flight data recorders must record at least 88 different parameters, including things like fuel flow, magnetic heading, airspeed, and control wheel position. Also coming under the black box heading is the cockpit voice recorder 
recorder, which, as the name suggests, picks up and records all conversation and noise inside the cockpit. Due to the important nature of the recorders, they have crash-survivable memory units, which are built to withstand crashes, pressure, and extreme heat. Also, as we mentioned before, in order that they be located easily after an accident, they are painted bright orange and mounted on a bright orange base. They also have underwater location beacons in case of an incident over water. In 1985, the black box would have been recording on magnetic tape rather than solid-state memory boards that are used nowadays. Also, even with its reputation as being able to survive a plane crash, there are instances of the flight data recorder and or cockpit voice recorder being unusable in the aftermath of a crash. It was on the Wikipedia page, List of Unrecovered and Unusable Flight Recorders, that Dan Futrell found out about the inaccessibility of Flight 980 and decided to try and find it. Looking at the list now, there are currently 59 entries from 1965 to the present day. <laughs> Just in case anyone's up for an adventure. In the majority of these cases, the flight data recorders have never been found, but in a few, one or both of the recorders have been destroyed and or rendered unusable, generally in a post-crash fire. So what happened to the flight data recorder from Flight 980? If there's only been a couple of that were ever destroyed, it does seem unlikely that that's what happened. Again, several theories. The first most obvious is that it was destroyed or at least badly damaged in the crash. Futrell and Stoner found parts of what was confirmed to be the outside of the black box, indicating that the outer case had at least been broken into many pieces. Was this by explosion or as a result of the crash? We don't know. The tape they found and brought back was not the correct size for the tape that would be used in the recorders. Oh, okay. Did we mention that previously? Because I thought it was the same type, which seemed like a hell of a coincidence. Okay, so forget everything I said about the Bolivians going up there and swapping it out for a children's show or whatever. If it's not the right, they'd have used the right tape. And also, they probably wouldn't have used one with a children's show recording on it, because that's just weird conspiracy theory right there. So, it's possible that the correct tape is still somewhere on Mount Ilamani. Finding pieces of brown magnetic tape that could potentially have blown anywhere is a lot harder than looking for the bright orange of the flight data recorder, but it's definitely not impossible that the tape is still out there. Whether it's usable, if found, is another question. Another theory is that the first climber up the mountain, Bernardo Garachi, got rid of the data recorders by throwing them off the mountain or something in order to aid in the cover-up of the situation. George Jen comes back into play here, theorizing in his Final Destination disaster book that Garachi was hired by the NTSB or Eastern Airlines themselves to get rid of the evidence so as not to expose Reagan's drug-running operation. This does seem increasingly unlikely. In his Outsider article, Peter Frick Wright sums this up with, It's a convoluted plot, too far-fetched to take seriously, but seductive as hell to those looking to explain the inexplicable. Or, dare we say it, those looking to decode the unknown. I heard another theory from the Shocking Details podcast on this story that the design of the plane itself might be to blame. The Boeing 727 had all three engines at the rear of the plane by the tail instead of under the wings. The black box would likely have been mounted somewhere near the rear staircase, meaning that if there was an explosion, pieces from all three engines could have destroyed it. If the plane flew straight into the mountain, the data recorder would likely have been in the direct path of at least one engine and could have fallen into it or been smashed by the engine coming through the body of the plane. Basically, there are some good reasons for how this thing got so beaten up. And how about the last perplexing point? What happens to the people? No bodies were ever found by any of the parties venturing up Mount Ilamani. So what happened to all the people on the plane? Futrell and Stoner did find six small body parts which they buried and geotagged, so no bodies isn't really correct anymore. If a body did cause the plane to go down, the lack of bodies here makes sense as they probably would be ejected before the plane hit the mountain. It's kind of weird that none have been found, especially as they would have been preserved in ice and snow, but that's presuming they'd have been in one piece. There were only 29 people on the plane, so could they all have been blown to smithereens in the crash? I suppose if an engine or two did come through the plane, there wouldn't be much left for anyone to identify. While no blood has also always been part of this mystery, Bernardo Garachi later confirmed to Peter Frick Wright that there had been blood at the scene. I guess not a lot, though, as no one else really mentioned it. Yeah, it's also going to go away pretty quickly and dry up and dry drain away. Um, I don't know. It does seem pretty... I can't. I don't believe there's the level of conspiracy where someone's going up and disposing of bodies. I can kind of lean in a little bit to the idea that the black box was tampered with, but I am kind of leaning towards there's, there's no conspiracy here. It's just it got destroyed. The fact that there's no bodies does kind of match up with the idea that there's no 
data recorder. The flight crash was just absolutely devastating, whether it's those engines coming through the plane, just a plane hitting a mountain at incredible speed. Um, it's just an, a, a devastating crash, just one that destroyed everything. Data recorder, bodies, everything. Maybe because they were looking for recognizable human bodies, everyone who'd made it up to the site overlooked the smaller pieces the Vitrell and Stoner later found. There would have been so much rubble that plane parts and something like a piece of a leg would go unnoticed, and the weather at the time was bad, with avalanches hampering the initial expedition, so it's not unlikely that the human remains would have quickly been buried or covered in snow. The caiman skins were still everywhere, though, so you might have thought that some more obvious signs of bodies would have been visible. The fact that Vitrell and Stoner found anything seems to confirm that some people at least were still in the plane when it hit the mountain, maybe squashing the bomb theory after all. Which is kind of a shame, as it tied a lot of things together for me. Conclusions So here we are at the end. And what have we learned? From what the 2016 expedition found, it now seems likely that the plane, for whatever reason, flew into the mountain and disintegrated. The passengers suffered a similar fate, with no trace, trace of them left behind by the time anybody managed to get up to the wreck site. The black box was destroyed or damaged to such an extent that the tape inside came free of the casing. Whether this tape is still on the mountain and is still usable is for hardier folk than me to find out, but that's what really holds the key to this whole incident. Do we think there were nefarious goings on? The fact that Eastern Airlines was implicated in a smuggling racket and then went under a few years later definitely adds some interesting offshoots to the narrative, as well as there being several high-profile passengers on board and a lot of contraband animal skins on the flight. People have been unimpressed with the NTSB's report, saying that it didn't investigate the incident fully or properly, but I guess, as we found out, there isn't much that you can do with limited communication reports, a difficult to reach crash location, and no data recorder. The main takeaway from researching this story is that, as well as the human cost, a lot of Caymans died for nothing. And also, if you happen to be going up a mountain, you must always acclimate, acclimate, acclimate. Yeah, so I have to say, after having all of this presented, I do, I am of the conclusion there wasn't a bomb. It was just an incredibly brutal flight that destroyed everything on board and shredded a lot of Cayman skins and scattered them everywhere. Anyway, this has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Maybe you're more conspiracy inclined. Let me know what you think. If you're watching on YouTube, leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. If you're uh, enjoying this show in its podcast form, yes, it's available there too. Why not leave a review? That's incredibly nice of you, especially if it's a good one. And thanks for listening or watching. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>